from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to Face the State. I'm MTN political analyst David Parker, joined today by Mike Dennison, our chief political reporter. It's that time of year when Montanans are scrambling to enjoy the last days of summer before the trees turn and the snow flies in September. <laughs> it's also our last chance to October. escape what's sure to be an onslaught of television ads. Uh, and in the spirit of the campaign fall season, mm, yes. we wanted to talk about the state of the major races, what that's going on here in Montana, where we're going, where we think things are going to uh, stand at this point, and where we think they're going to go into the fall. So, good to see you again, Mike. As always. Likewise. So let's talk presidential race, because I think we need to kind of get that landscape in place and then drill down to Montana. Where, where do we stand at this point in terms of Donald Trump? Well, in Montana, I, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, Donald Trump is going to win Montana. The question is by how much and whether that will have any effect on the down ticket races. I think that um, the polling that I've been hearing, I haven't seen any yet, but what I've been hearing is he's probably up about 20 points in 60-40 against Clinton, but that doesn't take into account what may happen with uh, the libertarian Gary Johnson, Green Party candidate, how, much, how many votes she may get. Uh, but th there's no doubt he's going to win and get our three electoral votes. But uh, what do you think about the down ticket effect of Trump or Clinton for that matter? Well, Gary Johnson's the type of candidate that could be quite attractive here in Montana. There's a lot of libertarian type Republicans. The, the, the main difference between him and Ross Perot, we have to remember Ross Perot won 26% of the vote here in 1992. Mm -hmm. So Ross Perot had a lot of money. Yeah. And I'm not sure the Libertarians have a lot of money. So that suggests I think there's a ceiling uh, of about maybe 10, 12 points for Gary Johnson. But what are the down ticket effects? It's interesting. I think we have to start from the premise of is Donald Trump better than a normal Republican candidate? Right? So what did Mitt Romney do back in 2012? What, 55%? About 55%. Yeah, 54? And that's about middle. Yeah. So if you go back to Bush, Bush got 60. Mm -hmm. And you go back to McCain, McCain got around like 48, 49%. Here's the main difference. Clinton is historically unpopular Democratic nominee. Absolutely. In Montana especially. In Montana especially. So you could suggest that this is not going to be like Barack Obama, right? Who is this well, kind of... That, that, I think that was a rather extraordinary circumstance. He actually campaigned here quite a bit. And you're not going to see Clinton spending a bunch of money in Montana. So if you put that in the context, if Trump really is a 60% candidate like George Bush, then you're going to run into some trouble because here's the thing. If you look at Montana in the microcosm, our college educated percentage is nationally about 29%. We're a little lower than that. We have a higher rural population. Uh, whites, 43% in the nation graduate from college, and that's definitely lower here in Montana as well. And we don't have a lot of minority voters here in the state. So this is mm -hmm. like ready, set for Trump. Mm -hmm. So that might be bad news for Democrats. What do you think? Well, I think if I'm Steve Bullock, the governor, running for re-election, he's the favorite to win at this point. But I think one of his biggest problems is Donald Trump because he has to get people who vote for Donald Trump to turn around and vote for him, enough of them, in order for him to win. It, so if Donald Trump is getting 60% you know, or higher, that's a lot of people that have to turn around and vote for Steve Bullock if he wants to win the election. And I think that could be a problem for him. On the other hand, Montana's set in this place where Montanans are the top vote sp split voters. They split their tickets more than anyone else in the country. Go back to 2004. Bush is winning 60%. Who wins the governor's seat? And Brian Schweitzer. Brian Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. So we're in the situation here where I think Montanans already think about, to some extent, these races a bit more independently than other people around the country. Well, and also, just think back four years, 2012, when Barack Obama lost pretty decisively in Montana, but John Tester beats Danny Reberg. Steve Bullock pulls out the win in the governor's race, so it's not like it hasn't happened before. Well, in fact, you go down to those Tier B races, and the only one that the Republicans took was the AG. Right. So we have a situation where that the effect might depend to some extent on whether or not Trump can keep that 60% up. Now let's transition to the governor's race. Mm -hmm. right, we've got Trump. We think that might help some Republicans. What's the state of the race between Gianforte and Steve Bullock? Well, we haven't seen any public polls yet, uh, but I'm hearing from people I talk to that uh, in, in private polls, because people are out there doing it, is that Gianforte may be about and 10 points down, um, or a little bit less, or a little bit higher, 
So I think at this point, you know, Bullock is sitting pretty good. We have a lot of time to go. There's going to be a lot of money spent on this race. But I think that we've said all along that it's Bullock's race to lose. I still think that is absolutely true. Uh, but like I said, there's many months to go. Put this in context. You know, you've been covering politics here in the state for a long time. What does this rem race remind you of from other past campaigns? Um, well, I don't know if it reminds me of other past campaigns, but it does remind me of a rule that I think holds fast in Montana. It's very difficult to beat an incumbent in Montana, especially an incumbent statewide office holder. Uh, it, 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 it rarely happens. Uh, the last time that a governor has lost, an, a sitting governor has lost, has been, was in 1980, and that was to someone from his own party, Ted Swindon beating Tom Judge in the Democratic primary. It, so to beat an incumbent is very difficult. That's the first thing. And second, the, the person trying to beat the incumbent here is Greg Gianforte, who still I don't think is that well known by a lot of Montanans. He's never run for political office before. He has a great record in business. He's got a lot of support from the business community and a lot of Republicans, but still he has to get the support of the general public, which may be more comfortable voting for the incumbent. Uh, that, that Schwinden race, why did Schwinden beat Judge? Well, that's been a long time, but I think you know, Judge had done a lot of things in office that uh, people saw as, um, well, I don't know what the word is, not underhanded, but just kind of maybe not totally above board. He had a lot of cri criticism for things he had done. And also, you know, the economy was you know, not in the greatest shape. You know, things were kind of starting to unravel there with that. Uh, we had uh, Jimmy Carter was president and high inflation. And Schwinden said, I'm the more steady hand. And, he, and that's how he beat him. Uh, but like I said, it's been a long time. I don't remember precisely. You know, if you look back, it was interesting. As I looked at the data, you know, nationally, and, you know, the last three cycles, about 85% of the time, an incumbent choosing to run for election for the governor's seat across the country wins. You know, Montana's odd, though. They actually have a lower percentage. But going back to 1945, 1944 on, 60% of the time, the incumbent, if they want run for re-election for the governor, win. Now, but the last time you're right that we actually had the, an incumbent lose was in 1980. So it's been a while. So this might be just, you know, stuff that coming out of the post-war era. So, you know, uh, definitely, I think, too, Bullock is in the catbird seat. And I was trying to think about Gianforte. Does he remind you at all of um, any other former governor's candidate that has run for office before? Um, you have some in mind. Who are, you, who are you thinking of? I'm thinking I, of maybe Brian Schweitzer. Well, uh, Gianforte reminding yeah, you of Brian yeah. Schweitzer? Um, well, not really. I mean, I saw Schweitzer as being much more aggressive and uh, much more of a big personality, whereas Gianforte, I mean, He's a good campaigner, and uh, he's a likable guy, but I don't, I don't really see him as a, as a Schweitzer. But here's a different way I think they are similar. Brian Schweitzer, as you know, challenged uh, Conrad Burns in the Senate in 2000, lost. But before that, Schweitzer had no political career. And he was a self-made man, right? He'd gone away to you know, do some irrigation mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East, came back, and he was a, a mint farmer, rancher. He was briefly a mint farmer up in the, up in the uh, Flathead. Although Schweitzer did have some political background. He had been appointed to a farming agency, a federal farm agency as, uh, on this farm committee that d decided things about farm loans. That's all I can remember. It was a very obscure thing. Mm -hmm. So he had been appointed during the Clinton administration. So he had some Democratic connections. Whereas Gianforte, of course, doesn't have that background. It's pretty much all in business. Yes, but he has been involved in politics and in he's, he's given to the Republican Party a right. lot for many years. He's been a big supporter of other Republicans. So, you know, he has been in the political realm and he has been up at the legislature lobbying. He lobbied for cutting income taxes back about 15 years ago. So in that respect, I think he is somewhat similar. Now, let's go back to something you mentioned earlier. Now, I, too, have heard that the race is about double digits, maybe 8, 12 points between Gianforte and Bulk. And again, we're speculating. We haven't seen any polls. Right. We've you know, heard chatter about mm -hmm. this. But let's, let's think about that for a moment. If that's true, does that surprise you at this point that that race is still potentially that far away? Well, um, a little bit, yes. And uh, you have to ask yourself why it's that far apart. And I think that one reason why is because uh, Bullock and the Democrats have very successfully beat up on Gianforte over the public lands and public access issue. I think this sort of distorted what happened, but it's been very effective. It's put him on the defensive. He's been talking about that, perhaps instead of talking about things that he'd rather talk about. Uh, 
I think that's one of the key reasons why that race may be farther apart than it should be at this moment. What I find interesting about that this particular campaign is Gianforte is acting in many ways like a very careful, strategic, well-honed, well-oiled candidate. One thing I would expect to challenge you to do is issue an, with an arc of ads, starting with their positives, talking about their biography. Which he has done. He's yeah. done that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he started in what? March, April? Is that about right? I'd say about April, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you actually look, and I just, I just talked to our, our folks at uh, MTN that kind of do all the ad buying and ad purchasing, and if you look at the number of spots, the number of advertising spots just on the MTN network, he has averaged pretty much about 50 spots a week. That's a lot. And he's pretty much been on mostly alone with the exception of when the RGA was in, Earlier, mm -hmm. earlier, the Republican Governors Association, which yeah. was in su support of him, mm -hmm. and then the DGA, right? Right. Now the thing is, though, is that Gianforte and his side had a lot more spots. They saturated the market. So, given the fact that already a lot of money has been dumped on TV, about a million dollars, I think, one would think that this race would have tightened, but it has not. So then, part of the question is, you think it's because he's been playing defense? Yes, because. Uh, a lot of that money that he's spent has been trying to counter this allegation that A, he's from out of state, or that he uh, didn't allow public access on his land, he's against uh, um, hunters and fishermen. Uh, he's saying, hey, I'm a Montana. His ads, you, you watch them, he's saying, I'm a Montana, I like to hunt and fish, I don't lock anybody out from my land. So, you know, he's spending time talking about that rather than maybe going after Bullock or rather than saying, here's my agenda, here's what I stand for, giving people a reason to vote for him, rather than playing defense. There's been no negative attack ads directly on Bullock in this race by the GM Forte campaign at all yet. Um, not that I can remember, although there, w there was one, the, the, the ad with the, uh, um, the taxidermist yeah. that kind of indirectly kind of took a stab at other politicians. What's interesting is I, I would kind of think of an analogy and one of the things I think Gianforte is having difficulty in terms of connecting with Montanans is this. He is an out-of-stater and he, he has done quite well for himself and I think people don't begrudge his success. The difference is the success began someplace else, was transferred here. Now I wonder if he had been born in Montana, gone elsewhere and made money and came back if Montanans might have been more forgiving. Well, um, that's assuming that, that your premise is correct, that there's some sort of resentment toward out-of-staters. And um, I think that's probably true. I, I would like to think that Montanans are, are big-hearted enough to overlook the fact that someone might have been born elsewhere. Um, but um, like I said, Bullock has been very successful, and the Democrats have been very successful as kind of using that as a hammer to paint a picture of Gianforte that they want people to have. You know, they're, they're defining him rather than him defining himself. Well, let's say this. Gianforte has been very successful in raising money. He actually last mm -hmm. quarter oh, yes. raised a lot of contributions, individual contributions, more than, than Steve Bullock did. He's definitely doing all the right things that we would expect of a seasoned candidate. What about Steve Bullock? Is he doing the right things? Well, I think he's running the classic incumbent campaign. And that's where you assume that you're the favorite. You talk about what you've done and the successes you've had. You don't put out any really radical new proposals or talk much about your agenda for the second term. You just say, hey, I'm gonna have more of the same. This is, this is what Brian Schweitzer did uh, when he ran for re-election in 2008. You know, as reporters, we're trying to say, okay, what do you got? What are you gonna do? And you just go, more of the same. What do you need to know that for? Uh, and I don't think Bullock is doing that quite to that degree He's had a few proposals out there. He's had an infrastructure proposal. He's, he's talked about uh, equal pay, and um, he, he's talked about clean energy and an energy plan, but he hasn't really hammered these. I mean, he, he's, he put them out there to have something, but mostly to say, look how well we've done, look at what, what good shape the budget is in, et cetera. Let's, let's actually, now, Steve Bullock's campaign finally went up on the air, and it was a pretty big buy, and they have Olympic advertising coverage. Let's mm -hmm. actually look at Bullock's first campaign ad and then we'll, then we'll discuss what we think about it. So why don't we pull that up? My wife Lisa and I grew up here. Send our kids to public schools here. Hike the same trails and fish the same streams as when we were kids. I'm Steve Bullock. 
And when I defend our right to hunt and fish on public lands, rivers, and streams, or work for better schools, and more good paying jobs that can support a family, those aren't political issues to me, they're personal. For our family, and for all Montanans. All right, so what do you think of that ad, Mike? Well, that's a good ad. I mean, that, <laughs> how can you not like Steve Bullock if you watch that ad? It, uh, it's warm and fuzzy, but also look what we talked about. He talked about public access. He talked about hunting and fishing. He talked about public schools, uh, which have gotten some good money from Bullock during his administration. Uh, you know, what's not to like? I mean, it, it's pretty generic, democratic, incumbent stuff. I don't like the ad. <laughs> okay. You like it. My wife yeah. liked it. I don't like the ad. I think it's nice and warm and fuzzy. I think it actually is geared to attracting uh, women voters, strong part of the Democratic base. Mm -hmm. Here's the negative. What I don't hear is here's exactly what I have done. I think it was a missed opportunity. It was an opportunity where he could actually talked about all these other things that he had proactively done in the governor's uh, seat. And it doesn't speak to white men, which is exactly the place that Democrats have trouble. I wanted to see more there. So I, I, I wasn't terribly thrilled with the ad. Well, but it is the first one. And, and like I said, I, I think incumbents often kind of stay away from detailed proposals when they run. They, they want to say, oh, you know, I'm a good guy. Look, I, I've done some good things. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Just keep me in, keep me in and we'll have a nice continuity of, of goodness. <laughs> well, it's going to be interesting uh, to see if that lasts when, uh, assumedly, the Gianforte campaign goes in uh, negative. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is, of course, we haven't seen a lot of special interest money in this race, and that might be related to the fact that maybe the race hasn't closed enough, because usually what happens, special interest money goes where they think they can have the biggest effect. Yes. I, it, and when you say special interest money, we mean groups other than the campaigns, like the Republican Governors Association, which spent early attacking Steve Bullock about uh, using the, uh, the governor's airplane um, irresponsibly or, or improperly. And, but they pretty much since then have backed off. And I'm surprised they haven't been in it. And you, you kind of wonder why, wh whether they look at this race as maybe not the greatest investment right now. Whereas on the other side, we have the Democratic Governors Association going after Gianforte hard uh, on the very things we talked about, you know, being from out of state, uh, the public access and public, um, public lands issue. And then we also have the Montana conservation voters announcing that they're going to spend a half a million dollars to try to defeat Gianforte and help Bullock get reelected. If you look at the scene nationally, there are 12 gubernatorial races on the ballot across the country. And if you look at Cook Political Report, four of those are solid Republican or Democrat, four are toss up, three of those op are open seats that are Democratic held, and one of those is a, a GOP incumbent in North Carolina. Guess what? The RGA is spending money in Missouri, mm -hmm. it's spending money. In North Carolina, but it's not necessarily spending money here. And, and where is Montana? Likely Democrat, not uh, uh, Weens Democrat. Mm -hmm. So it looks like nationally there are other races that the Republicans are finding that they want to play in right now. Well, that would have to be the presumption. I mean, I called the RGA about oh about you know, three or four weeks ago, um, saying what. What's your strategy? What are you going to be doing? And I, I didn't expect them to tell me, but I had, a, I had a specific question about some issues. I said, are you going to come in on this issue? And their answer was, um, well, maybe. Um, we don't discuss our strategy with you, Mike. And that's all I heard. So let's look at actually Greg Gianforte's latest ad. That's the next one in the queue. So let's pull that up. Hi, I'm Steve Daines. And here in Montana, we're not afraid of a tough fight. But we do expect him to be fair. You've seen the dark money attack ads against Greg Gianforte. The folks running those couldn't find Ekalaka or Eureka on a Montana map. And I'm here to tell you, they're flat out lies. Greg and I have hunted together. Greg and I have fished together. Greg and I have worked together creating good, high paying Montana jobs. Greg is a proven leader and a good man. And I got to know Greg as we worked side by side for over 12 years creating good, high paying jobs for Montanans, as well as backpacking trips with our families as we passed on our Montana way of life to our children. Cindy and I are grateful to call Greg and Susan our friends. And no matter what the outside special interests call him, I'm looking forward to calling Greg Gianforte our next governor. Why that ad? Well, just what we've been talking about. I mean, playing defense. Here's Steve Daines, respected U.S. Senator, 
nice guy, everybody likes Steve Daines, so he's going to come in and be uh, the straw man for Gianforte and say, if you like me, you got to like this guy. And I don't know how effective that will be, but still, they're spending a lot of time, that's a long ad, and talking about issues that the Democrats want them to talk about. What I think is important here is uh, there has to be a pivot now to basically getting onto different terrain and going after Bullock. So if we, if we had to assess this right now, you would say, who's going to win in November? Well, as we said, it, it, it's, it's Bullock's to lose, unless Bullock makes a big mistake. And there are some things out there that Bullock has done that uh, um, you know, the, the airplane travel, uh, things that might be a negative effect that I think are, are going to come into play. Uh, there'll be some more reporting on it, and there'll be some more attention paid to it. But if that doesn't really dent his popularity or his lead, it's going to be a tough one for Gianforte to close it. I think the most critical damage, uh, danger that the uh, Bullock campaign face right now is there's, all, there's that lingering question about having three lieutenant governors, the situation with the last lieutenant governor and why she ended up leaving. That's one issue that, that you've heard about. I expect to see paid advertising on. And the other issue is, is Montana's economy continuing to grow? And exactly. And uh, yeah. what, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, What's the, what are the I numbers think, showing? Yeah, the other issue that um, is the economy. Montana's economy is slowing down a little bit. As, as you know, the nation kind of struggles a bit, but Montana's economy, especially in the rural areas in the eastern part of the state, with commodity prices at pretty much historic lows across the board, oil, gas, copper, coal, ag prices, you know, beef, wheat, barley, uh, they're, they're right down there, and so will Steve Bullock be blamed for that? I mean, I think that's kind of a tough argument to make because it's more you know, national, international economic forces, but the economy is slowing down. The important thing here to realize is that people vote perceptions, and if they're feeling pinched, that will help hurt Bullock, and the Gianforte campaign has been trying to capitalize and earn media on this. They're going to have to move to paid media next on this particular issue. But if you think about moving forward, the race that Bullock won in 2012 was tight. Do you remember how many votes? Oh, no, but it was like he had, he had less than 50 percent. I mean, he had like 48, 49 percent. It was 7,500 votes. It was closer than that Tester Reberg race for sure. Yeah, it was close. And if you, if you pull that out, if you look at the numbers very clearly, rural areas, you can, Democrats get about you know, roughly a third, 35 percent of the vote out of rural areas that are not Democratic counties. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking like, for example, Hill County or a lot of the reservation counties. If the Gianforte campaign can pull off about 5% of that Democratic base and Bullock gets his normal votes out of the urban areas, Gianforte could win. So I do see a path. I suppose, and it, it depends on the turnout too. Um, and uh, it depends on the turnout in the urban areas as well. So, you know, obviously it sounds trite. A lot of this is about turnout. Yeah. Uh, we've talked a lot about the governor's race. We've got about, you know, five and a half minutes less left. Let's try to talk a little about the House race and what the effect of that race, if that race is going to be competitive, and what we're going to be looking for between Denise Juno and Ryan Zinke. Well, I don't know if it's going to be competitive. I think everyone assumes that Zinke is um, going to win and that, if, that Denise Juno is a, is a real underdog. But you know, she's been raising a lot of money. She's pretty close to him on cash on hand, so it could be a contest. What we're waiting to see is what happens from outside sources. If uh, national uh, democratic or liberal groups are going to come in for Juno, or on the other side, whether Zinke may get some help as well. Uh, right now, I think they're, they're kind of sizing it up and waiting to see what happens. No, no ads have run yet, uh, and this is a race that always seems to kind of be in the background behind the governor's race or behind the U.S. Senate race, since Montana's House seat is one of 435 in the Congress, and so it's not that big of a deal politically. Democrats have not had good luck when it comes to the House seat. The last time they won a statewide House campaign was 1994, and mm -hmm. that was Pat Williams, and it was an interesting situation, right? Yeah. Pat had moved from mm -hmm. serving in the district to the west of the state, running against Ron Marlin in 92, winning, and then winning re-election in 94, then retiring. But since then, Democrats haven't held the seat. Why? Um, well, I think a lot of reasons. One is because they often haven't had very good candidates running. Um, it, I think they had the best shot when it was an open seat, and that was in 2000. Yep, that's when right. Denny Reberg beat Nancy, Nancy Keenan. Keenan. Mm -hmm. Pretty close race. And the race they had two years ago when it was open, uh, it's just a bad year for Democrats. I mean, it was an off-election off year, uh, low turnout, advantage Republicans. 
And now may be one of the best chances they have to beat an incumbent in a presidential year. And it just kind of depends on uh, you know, what Denise Juno does, how well she runs her campaign, what issues she chooses to focus on, um, and if they get attention. I mean, the governor's race and the presidential race is sucking up all the attention. John Lewis, who was the Democratic nominee in that race in 2014, was not, I thought, a very good candidate in this sense. He was a Bacchus staffer. And I think it was a horrible time to be a Bacchus staffer running for Congress in 2014. He didn't have any political space, but, but he raised more money than any other Democrat running for the money. House seat yeah. since Nancy Keenan. Mm -hmm. However, Ryan Zinke's numbers are eye-popping. Well, they're eye-popping in terms of the total, but he's spending a lot, too. I mean, I look at how much money is sitting in the bank. He's already reserved TV time for the fall. So is and, Denise Juno, by the way. Actually, okay. Yeah. And Juno, I mean, you know, Juno has run twice statewide. She has name recognition. That's something John Lewis didn't have at all. And so I think she has an advantage there. Uh, I think this race you know, could be a little closer than we expect. It's just too early to say. We haven't really seen people start to throw their punches. You're right. The one thing about the Zinke campaign is that he raises a, an amazing amount of money. I'm going to put this in perspective. From 2002 to 2012, you add all, all the money that Denny Reberg raised and the money that Steve Daines ran, raised for the one race that he ran, Zinke's raised more <laughs> since, uh, oh, yeah. uh, than, than all of that combined in 2014 and 2016. But here's the thing, he spends a lot of it. Yeah. And, and you said he's spending it on mail fundraising. Well, he's spending $3 for every four he takes in. And I haven't looked at his spending on his recent report, but we looked at one earlier this year. There's, he has a couple of uh, consultants in Washington, D.C., or the D.C. area that he spent uh, quite a lot of money on. And uh, I think these are uh, uh, organizations that are helping him raise money. So he's spending money to raise money. Juno, in terms of her fundraising, she's actually slightly exceeding the clip of John Lewis. So that's good for her. That mm -hmm. means that she's, she's, uh, she's, getting, she's getting the resources she needs to try to be competitive. Looks like we're going to have ads in mid-September from both Juno and Zinke, according to the ad buys I've seen. What is interesting is the native vote. Democrats always say native vote's gonna, mm -hmm. gonna win the day. What do you hear on that? Well, both sides have, um, the Democrats have a, a Native American uh, person who's in charge of trying to get this vote out. But Republicans have uh, Representative Bruce Myers from Box Elder who's helping them organize as well. Uh, I think we have to remember that the, that the Native American vote is still fairly small. It's, it's not a lot of voters in Montana. So they have the turnout en masse to really have an impact. What's interesting is that there's been a dispute with uh, the counties and the Secretary of State and the Department of Justice about you know, p creating these satellite offices. Mm -hmm. And satellite offices were put in a lot of the reservation counties. And the question is, did they make a difference? I looked at the primary numbers. So in Glacier, in 2012, in the primary there, presidential primary there, 30% turnout in Glacier County. It went up to 43% uh, in 2016. Bighorn was flat, but there was this uh, uptick in Roosevelt from 24 to 32. Rosebud, 37 to 41. So it looks like those satellite offices and maybe some of these uh, turnout efforts may bear fruit for the Democrats. Well, um, that's, Native Americans do vote Democratic, no doubt about that. But um, like I said, it's just a matter of how many of them actually vote. Well, that was a, a kind of an overarching summary of the gubernatorial race, the House race. We didn't get to the other ones, but that's why we have more shows. We'll see you next week when we talk to Senator Steve Daines. Thanks for joining us on Face the state. You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.